Good morning and a very warm welcome to you on this Sunday, the 23rd of January. Um, it's good that you can join us uh, this morning. Uh, just a couple of notices before we get going. Uh, firstly, uh, this coming Thursday, there is a meeting at 11 o'clock uh, to start planning for the postponed arts festival from last year, and it will be on the last weekend of June this year. So that's an arts festival meeting this coming Thursday at the church at 11 o'clock. And also to let you know that uh, next Sunday is our fifth Sunday of the month. So, of course, it's our fifth Sunday giving. And this month we are giving to Norwich Youth for Christ. Uh, it, I will be saying a bit more about that next week. But just to say um, the majority of people uh, actually turn to Christ, become Christians um, under the age of 25. And uh, it's so important, the work that is done among young people. And Norwich Youth of Christ uh, have been doing fabulous work here in Norwich for many decades. And we're going to support them in their important work among young people here in our city. So um, the giving, fifth Sunday giving for next week is Norwich Youth for Christ. I'll say a bit more about them next week. But just in case you miss next week um, and uh, or just want to get uh, your giving ready and pray about how much to give, the giving next week is going to Norwich Youth for Christ. Well, today we continue our series in the book of Daniel, and uh, we have called the series Making Sense of the Times, because the times we are in, to many people, don't make sense. And uh, Mike is going to be uh, reflecting on Daniel chapter 2 and an enduring kingdom. But before all that, we begin with our call to worship, which is taken from Psalm 145. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might, so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. Let's pray. Gracious God, we come rejoicing in your presence and proclaim the glory of your kingdom. For your mercy reaches from the heavens to the very depths. And your kindness and grace are seen in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now take our worship, all we have and all we are, for your glory's sake. Amen. Well, there are uh, some songs uh, that, uh, if you go back, there are links to opening songs, uh, beginning with the song Men of Faith. And if you want to just pause at this point and go to those songs now, please do so. Otherwise, just wait where you are and we'll carry on in just a moment. Well, let us come before the Lord with humble hearts and confess our sins. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. Well, may God our Father forgive us our sins and bring us to the fellowship of his table with his saints forever. Amen. 
and our offertory prayer and our prayer uh, we pray together. Loving God, in your generosity, you've given us life through your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Now bless these gifts and our lives for your kingdom's sake. Amen. Well, as I said a few moments ago, our reading is carrying on from in the book of Daniel. Last week we had Daniel chapter 1, and now Daniel chapter 2, from verse 24 to 49. So let's listen to God's word. Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. Arioch took Daniel to the king at once, and said, I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. The king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, Are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel replied, no wise man, enchanter, magician or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he's asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you are lying in your bed are these. As your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to things to come, and the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me. Not because I have greater wisdom than anyone else alive, but so that your majesty may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. Your majesty looked, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands, he's placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds in the sky. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are that head of gold. After you, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it. 
even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honour and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you are able to reveal this mystery. And the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, chief ministers over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, now Mike is going to come and bring our reflection. Let's pray for Mike uh, and for ourselves. Loving God, we thank you for the preparation that Mike has done and for the words that you have given him. Now bless those words and open our ears to hear them, that we may truly live to the glory of your holy name. Amen. So, Mike, over to you. Thank you, Mark. So, quite a, quite a long reading there and lots of uh, information in it. Uh, what I'm hoping to do is by pressing it a little bit and recapping some of the more relevant verses, we'll be able to keep the big picture in our mind. And I've got a, a couple of slides that hopefully will uh, will help with that process as well. Our reading today starts with Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He was obviously thinking about his future and what it held for him and his family. How long would his rule last? What was his legacy going to be? Uh, I don't know if that's a dream or that's a nightmare, um, whatever it is. But isn't it strange how some people want to leave a legacy? And if we look across the road, we can see some of the vanity projects of politicians and rulers uh, in the example of the youth and community centre across the road. Cast your mind back to Boris Johnson's vision of a garden bridge across the Thames, or you might like to think of the pyramids in Egypt. But there are some people who leave a legacy, not because of these sort of vanity construction projects, but because of their very life. And here I'm thinking of, say, Albert Einstein and E equals MC squared, which I think most people can recall, even if we're not fully able to articulate it. Martin Luther King and his I have a dream speech, or Nelson Mandela with his meteoric rise from prisoner to president in about a year. Now, I hope you'll excuse my shorthand for their much more significant contributions to modern life. But some people do seem to be driven by wanting to leave a mark on something more permanent. And I think Nebuchadnezzar was that kind of person. 
And I'm recalling a quote from Billy Graham, who said, actually, the greatest legacy one can pass on to one's children and grandchildren is not money or other material things that are accumulated in one's life, but rather a legacy of character and faith. And that's the sort of legacy that I think is worth striving for. So Nebuchadnezzar has this dream. It clearly worries him. Can he remember it? Unclear a little bit. Perhaps he couldn't. We often don't remember our dreams, do we, when we wake up? But just know we've had a disturbing dream. Or was he testing his wise men? Perhaps he didn't quite trust them. He challenged them on pain of death to tell him what the dream was and what it meant. Whilst they might have been able to have fudged the issue, telling him what the dream, what the dream meant, once he told them what it was, they weren't able to tell him what the dream was in their own power. Consequently, the wise men are set to be killed by Ariok. And to save the wise men, which probably includes Daniel and his friends, Daniel acts. He prays along with his friends, and God reveals in a dream, in a vision to Daniel, what the dream was. Daniel goes to Arioch saying, don't execute the wise men. Take me to the king. I will interpret his dream. And when the king asks Daniel in verse 27, can he tell him? what the dream was and its meaning, Daniel replies, and this might seem a bit strange to begin with, no wise man, enchanter, magician or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But it's quickly followed, isn't it, with a but. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. I say it's a very bold step. At first, it sounds like Daniel is like the other wise men, impotent and unable to interpret and say what the dream was. But he goes on to say that God has shown him in a vision what the dream was and its meaning. And there we can see in verses 32 and 34, Daniel goes on to describe what this statue looks like. It has a head of pure gold. It has arms and a chest of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, feet of iron and baked clay. And Daniel goes on to say that in verse 34 that we see a stone not hewn by man's hand is hurled at the statue which shatters into dust. It's like chaff and it's blown away. I can certainly see why Nebuchadnezzar was worried. Was he the statue? Was he about to be destroyed? What then of his legacy? And then in verses 37 onwards, we get the interpretation of the dream. But notice this, not before Daniel reminds Nebuchadnezzar that he is king only sorry, that he is king of kings only because the God of heaven has given him that position. It is clear that this is something that's going to happen in the future, something after the king's reign. It's interesting reading this up and looking at what these things might mean. The scholars can't exactly agree on the meaning, but the usual assignment is something like this. From the interpretation of Daniel, we learn that the head, the pure gold, is the Babylonian kingdom and empire. The arms and the chest, silver, are normally thought of being the Medo-Persian empire that followed it. The belly and thighs of bronze, Greek empire, Macedonian empire, Alexander the Great, the legs of iron, Rome, the Roman empire. The last one is normally where they separate, and this is thought to be some of the modern kingdoms, Europe maybe, but divided nations. Nations may be at war with themselves and with each other internally. Now, I'm not convinced we actually need to know which the empires or kingdoms really are. 
certainly at the time it would not have been possible to say that the dream because the dream described future events but i want to avoid going any further down that rabbit warren the big picture is that all of these kingdoms all of these empires are blown away by a stone which then grows to become a mountain which covers the whole earth initially i'm sure King Nebuchadnezzar was relieved to know that these events would occur after his time and not during. And I'm sure we can hear him sigh and go, phew. And then in verses 46 to 47, we can see the king's reaction. It says there, King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honour and ordered that an offering of incense be presented to him. The king says to Daniel, surely your king, your, your, if I could read it would help. Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and revealer of mysteries. For you were able to reveal this mystery. How surprising this vignette would have looked to the onlookers. The mightiest of kings falling prostrate, prostrate, prostrate before his servant, his bondsman his slave, this person that was held partly as, as a hostage against up an uprising. The king clearly knew it wasn't Daniel himself who revealed these, th these things, but it was the God of Israel who revealed these things through Daniel. So hopefully that's a, a quick recap of the scene and the setting of it. And if you've got a Bible open, you might want to check and see if I've left anything out. What does this mean for us today? Well, firstly, I think that sets a pattern for spiritual leadership. Way back at the start, when Daniel goes to Arioch, saying he can interpret and describe what the dream is, Arioch immediately takes Daniel before the king and proudly says, I have found among the exiles from Judah someone who can tell the king what his dream means thus claiming at least some of the glory for himself for finding Daniel. Compare that to Daniel's approach. He didn't say he could interpret the dream, but God in heaven could because he is in control of all things. Daniel acted only an extremist to save his friends, as well as the other Babylonian wise men as a consequence. He did not seek prominence, or spiritual leadership. He sought to remain faithful to God, despite the complex religious, moral, and ethical circumstances that he was faced with being in exile. Much of the story of Daniel shows a group of friends who remain steadfast in their trust and reliance on God. The royal food incident that we looked at last week or the fiery furnace incident, or the lion's den that we'll be looking at later. These events all speak of a steadfast trust in God in the face of life-threatening situations. And while most of us won't face life-threatening situations, because of our faith, we all face complex situations where our moral, ethical, and religious concerns are being channel challenged by the ways of this world. Daniel and his friends put their faith and trust in God. They held on to their fundamental beliefs. They did not compromise those beliefs, but did accept some changes as a necessary consequence of their exile. If we hold too strongly to our convictions, we might be seen as harsh and uncaring. On the other hand, if we accept too many compromises, what are we left with? for we have compromised God's truth. And I'm reminded of Jehoshaphat, who made an alliance with King Ahab, only to be rebuked for his compromises by the prophet Jehu. And this is a big challenge to us all, isn't it? To remain true to God's calling and to act with integrity rather than compromise. The challenge is as it was for Daniel and his friends, to pick our battles, to pick what is foundational and protect those at all costs. The stone that destroys all these Gentile kingdoms is Christ ushering in God's kingdom 
through his crucifixion and resurrection. Here we can see this starting as something small, the stone thrown against this mighty statue. And if it helps, here's an image of just that event. Mountains, of course, are symbolic. They are something solid and permanent. Mountains are places where in the Old Testament people went to be close to God, and in the New Testament as well. Think of Mount Sinai and Moses receiving the Ten Commandments, Mount Ararat and Noah's Ark, Mount Moriah, where Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac, and where Solomon built the temple, when Jesus re uh, retired up the hillside to be alone, to be closer with God. Mountains seem to be special places of closeness with God and become associated with God. Unlike the earthly kingdom, God's kingdom will not be destroyed or replaced. It is eternal and enduring. Nothing can stand in its way. Think of the attempts to snuff out the early church and of the troubles people had. But Peter's miraculous escape from prison when his chains fell off. And we can read about that in Acts chapter 12 and be inspired by verse 24, which says that the word of God continued to spread and flourish. It was not defeated by the things of this world. And that fits nicely, doesn't it, with the imagery of the stone growing into a mountain? How about the passage in Isaiah? 9 chapter, uh, verse 7 talking of the increase of his government or dominion there shall be no end to the increase of his government and of peace he shall rule on the throne of david and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from that time forward and forevermore the zeal of the lord of hosts will accomplish this and like these other earthly kingdoms in the dream God's kingdom is one that will flourish and never fade away, one that will grow. Christ, who ushered in this kingdom, has defeated Satan, sin and death through his sacrifice on the cross and his resurrection. And we can see the everlasting and eternal nature of God's kingdom in our opening reading this morning and in other places. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, we read, in those times of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but will itself endure forever. Well, later on in the book of Daniel, in chapter 7, verse 14, he was given authority and sovereignty and sovereign power. All nations and people of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Or in Luke chapter 1, verse 33, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Or if we skip right to the end of the New Testament, in Revelation chapter 11 verse 15 the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our lord and of his messiah and he will reign forever and ever there will be no end i think that last reading in revelation fits very nicely and tightly with the with the imagery of the earthly kingdoms being swept away and replaced by god's kingdom what a wonderful and consoling thought in times of hardship that God's kingdom will last forever whatever we're going through it is only temporary and transient the everlasting nature of Christ's kingdom is to be a comfort for us knowing that he is in charge and rules over all things for the good of his kingdom whenever a new ruler or a leader emerges isn't it it's quite natural isn't it to have hope for a brighter future, a better life for ourselves. But how often when we look back over world history, do we see those high hopes in new political leadership dashed? How often were there promises to re-establish former glories? 
And I'm thinking of things like Make America Great Again or re-establishing our rightful place in the world stage by leaving Europe. Perhaps laudable aims, but ones that are not delivered on. Or perhaps it's to establish a new world order that we turn to some of these new charismatic leaders. A new world order with ourselves at the top, of course, such as establishing a new thousand year Reich or a new Roman Empire under Mussolini or a new French Empire. So good. They liked it so much that they had two goes at it, didn't they? They had a first and a second empire. Rulers often promise so much, and yet for many of their subjects, they deliver very little. And it's perhaps not surprising when their main driver is that it's all about them, their power, their position, their authority, their legacy, rather than the benefits for all of their citizens. The only ruler that can deliver on his promises, that he has our best interests at heart, the only one who can ever do that is Jesus. Monarchs and rulers of this world don't bring us the comfort that we have in Christ's reign. And like all the other kingdoms, the empires of man, Christ's reign is the one that lasts through all generations and for eternity. Our king has showered us with, an undes with undeserved blessing after blessing. He has defeated all his enemies and has conquered death. Satan has no claim over us. We have been freed from the consequences of our own sin and thus spared that ultimate death. We are spared from all these things because of Christ's sacrifice and resurrection. What blessings has he given us? Well, they're going to be different in each case, aren't they? For some, it might be a spouse, a family. For others, it might be a single life. It might be a talent or a skill or an ability. It might be an occupation or a career or a calling. And for many of us, it might now be retirement. Think of all those difficult times when we've asked for his help and our path has been made easier. I'm not saying it's necessarily been made easy, but certainly been made easier when we're following our Lord and the path that he has set for us. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Our ruler is not so busy with bolstering his own ego or preparing his own legacy that he is oblivious to our plight or our needs, but is actually concerned about and engaged in our welfare. The kingdom, of Christ, the kingdom Christ ushers in is a now and yet to be kingdom. It was present when Jesus rose from the dead and will reach its glorious conclusion when he comes again in glory. Now, communion, we often say as much, don't we, as, as, as we probably soon will. When we read Paul's instructions in Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We are proclaiming Christ's death until he comes, a death that has freed us from our sin and the consequences of sin through his resurrection. Not because we've done anything to deserve it, but because we were foolish enough to believe in Christ Jesus. And through the Son, we are saved. And we pray for God's kingdom to come, don't we, in the Lord's Prayer. And in Daniel, I think we have that signpost of the coming of God's kingdom, not only in heaven, but here on earth too, as Jesus Christ is that stone ushering in God's kingdom. I said anyone seeing the king's reaction and prostrating himself before Daniel would be surprised by it. And I wonder if some of the wise men, perhaps spared because of Daniel's actions, came to believe in the God of heaven. Two weeks ago, Mark spoke of the Magi, three wise men or kings from the east. Tradition has it that there were three of them, weren't, weren't there? Um, now, who are they? Uh, Balthazar, Gaspar, Malchior. Balthazar, tradition holds that he was a king of Macedonia. Gaspar derives from a Chaldean word 
the Chaldeans being the racial elite, the wise men of Babylonian, and Melchior was king, was assigned, was thought to be king of Persia traditionally. It's strange, isn't it, how these two biblical passages seem to intertwine about the thought of wise men from the east, what was formerly Babylonia. I recall one of the elders in the church that we went to in Bath saying there were no such things as coincidence, only God created instances, God instances, he called them. And this was in response when we said it was not coincidence, wasn't it, that we bought our first home from the church secretary, not knowing at the time that he was the church secretary and before we had even joined the church. And it was the church at which Jan first came to faith and I rediscovered mine. No coincidence then. The wise men, the magi at Christ's birth, came from around Babylonia, where Babylon was situated. Had some of the Chaldeans come to see the God of Israel was not only the revealer of mysteries, but the God of gods. Had they gone on to believe in the God of Israel? Speculation, but they were certainly aware of the Jewish teachings and prophecies, hence them seeing the star telling of Christ's birth and traveling to honor the king. I don't think God leaves it to chance or to the odd coincidences. Why do I say Christ is that stone, you might ask? Well, it's an image that's often used for Christ, being a living stone or a cornerstone. We often talk about Christ being the stone rejected by the builders, don't we? In passages such as Psalm 118, verse 22, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone or 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 4 and 5 as you come to him the living stone rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him you also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifice offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. I do like that last bit in the reading. Christ is the living stone rejected by humans, by the religious leaders of Christ's day, but one precious to God. Verse five also goes on to say, we too are to be living stones built into a spiritual house through Jesus Christ. We are to be a holy or royal priesthood. And as such, one duty, is to share Christ with others, to plant in them the seeds of faith. They may be our children, they may be complete strangers, but that is what each and every single one of us is called to do. I remember the old TV ads when the, an IT system crashed and they all sat around the table and the head of the table asked whose responsibility is it? And they all turned to her and looked at her for it was her responsibility. Well, the answer is that it is our personal and individual responsibility to share Christ with those around us. I'm aware of uh, a US business guru called Peter Stropel. And when he was talking about legacy, he put it this way. Legacy is not leaving something for people. It's leaving something in people. That's something for us to be left in people as surely Christ. For Christ instructs us to share his message of salvation with others and thus to leave Christ in others. Legacy is not leaving a monument for posterity. It's about leaving Jesus in people's lives, being that living stone in the family of believers, being built into that spiritual temple. There are many things we can draw out of our passage this morning. But let me just reinforce four of them. Firstly, Daniel's vision, the power and wisdom of God is clearly and undeniably demonstrated. The Babylonian wise men and their gods could not tell Nebuchadnezzar what his dream was. But through God, Daniel was given the dream and its meaning. God's kingdom ushered in 
through Jesus Christ will sweep away all earthly kingdoms and it will last eternally. His reign will be forever. And in Daniel, we have a spiritual we have a spiritual leadership model caught between a rock and a hard place, forced to act. Otherwise, he and his friends would have been killed along with the wise men. He acted out of necessity, but with great faith. And the first thing he did was to gather his friends to pray with him. And lastly, should we worry about what our legacy is? The legacy we are called to leave behind is planting the seed of faith in others. Shall we just close in prayer? Lord, may we be like Daniel, seeking to remain true to God and our calling. May we turn to the eternal kingdom of God when faced with complex moral and ethical decisions, remaining true to the faith we have in Jesus Christ and his eternal reign. Amen. Well, thank you, Mike, for your message to us today. Plenty of us, uh, plenty to get uh, our, our thinking caps on and uh, plenty for us to, you know, to, to chew over uh, in the coming week. So uh, thank you to you, Mike, and for that message to us today. We now come to our prayers of intercession. So uh, let's continue in prayer. Let's pray. Lord our God, our present help in times of trouble. We come before you trusting in your goodness and mercy and in our desire to see the fullness of your kingdom. Lord, we pray for the church. Help us to build our lives on the firm foundation of your teaching in scripture. Strengthen your church when it is beset by the storms of the world, that we may remain firm in the hope you have given us and obedient to your word always. We pray for the persecuted church, for those hiding in fear of their lives, for those in prison, for those who are alone, Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. May your people remain faithful to you. Lord, we pray for the world. We pray for those who are seeking meaning and purpose to their lives. For those whose lives are empty. For those who are looking in the wrong places for truth, love hope and peace. We pray that they may discover the life only you can give. We pray for those who teach and influence others, for those who set standards and offer ways of right living for society. We pray for all involved in government, in broadcasting, in the press. And finally, Lord, we pray for all whose lives have fallen apart, those who've lost loved ones, who've lost freedom, employment, and a place to call home. We this week pray for the island nation of Tonga following the tsunami this week. Please open the hearts of the nations to this small country, that the people of Tonga would get the help they need. As we pray for Tonga, we also pray for our own homes and loved ones, that we may know your blessing. And all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And we pray together the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, if you want to sing the closing uh, song, which is the hymn, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. If you want to sing that now, just press pause, go back to the link and enjoy that uh, at your heart's content. Otherwise, just wait here for a moment. We now come to our closing prayer and blessing. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you for joining me this week and I look forward to seeing you again next week as we continue our series in Daniel. Bye for now.